we'll start with one of the most recent and shocking discoveries of 2020. Perhaps our solar system has life beyond Earth. This is Venus, the second planet from the Sun and the sister of our home planet. It's called so because it has a similar size and mass, but the conditions on it are simply terrible. The temperature on its surface reaches 890 degrees Fahrenheit because of the greenhouse effect, and the atmospheric pressure on it is as strong as if you were 3,000 feet underwater. But in this hostile world, there can actually be life. For many years, there have been discussions on this subject. In 2007, scientists discovered there once had been an ocean on Venus. That is, in the distant past, there could have been some form of life. But in the fall of 2020, there was an epic argument in which scientists tried to find out whether life on Venus exists right now. In September, the discovery of a new life marker on Venus was announced. The ALMA telescope in the Atacama Desert found phosphine gas above the planet, and the amount of this gas suggested that it may have been produced by certain microorganisms. But already in October, the data was analyzed again, and the new results indicate it was an error. So today, we consider Venus to be uninhabited once more. But who knows, maybe soon we'll get new data, and new disputes will arise in scientific circles. And while some scientists are scratching their heads and still concentrating on Venus, others have looked into distant space and discovered 24 planets on which life can exist. And on all of them, living conditions are much better than on Earth. Such planets are called superhabitable. These super planets must be 1.3 times larger than the Earth and twice as massive. Thus, they will have stronger gravity and, as a consequence, a denser and warmer atmosphere. So, the climate on superhabitable planets must be similar to the tropical climate on Earth. This will ensure the maximum diversity of living organisms. The host star of such a planet must be a red dwarf. They're much smaller than the sun and not so bright, but their lifespan can reach 70 billion years. For comparison, the lifespan of the sun is seven times shorter, and it's already past half of it. Slow and steady wins the race. It will give enough time for potential life to develop and evolve. And here's a suitable planet for the title of superhabitable, Kepler 1649c. In 2020, it was named the most similar planet to Earth. It's only 6% larger than our home world. It orbits a red dwarf, a quarter the size of our sun. The planet is in the habitable zone of the star and makes a complete circle around it in 19.5 days. The climate on Kepler remains a mystery. It's known to receive about 75% of the light we get from the sun. So the temperature on its surface may be close to Earth's, but we still don't know the composition of the atmosphere and other necessary conditions for life to appear there. The next discovery is one of the most amazing spectacles ever seen by humanity. It's the collision of a star with a black hole. In September 2019, scientists began watching how, for six months, a sun-like star was being spaghettified. Light from this event traveled 215 million light years, and we saw a star about 860,000 miles wide slurped up by a black hole. This black disk is so heavy that it has incredibly strong gravity. Nothing can leave its gravitational field. And now we see a star slowly approaching it. First, the glowing light layers of the star begin to stretch towards the black hole. It looks as if the star is simply unrolling like a ball of thread. Then we see this hot plasma lingering at the edges of the black hole. And it may seem these particles are now orbiting it, but it's just an illusion. This ring of light is called the event horizon. The black hole curves not only space, but time as well. This close to it, time slows down. To the observer, it looks as if the light near the edge of the black disk has almost stopped. But in fact, it has long been absorbed by the dark abyss. When a black hole eats a certain amount of star material, it starts spitting it out. 
powerful beams of energy are ejected at speeds of over 6,000 miles per second. This is the light that attracted scientists' attention. In the end, the black hole has completely absorbed about half of the star and spit out the other half into space. And even though we watched this process for only a couple of minutes, it was happening for six months. And here is one of the youngest planetary systems that humanity has ever observed, AU Microscopii. It's so young, there's still a disk around it from the debris this system was made of. But this time, we don't even hope to find life here. The host star of this exoplanet continually emits radiation flares that would wipe out any form of life from the planet's surface. The planet that orbits this dangerous star is called AU Mic B, and it's just a newborn baby by astronomical standards. It's so close to its star that it makes a complete circle around it in 8.5 days. The age of this planet is only 12 million years. So at the time AU Mic B was born, mastodons walked on the surface of our planet and meadows and savannas were covering the Earth's face. So you and I can consider ourselves old timers because the age of the Earth is almost 4.5 billion years. The next discovery took place in early 2020 and it's very similar to a landscape from science fiction. It's a planet with two suns. Well, more precisely, it doesn't orbit around a single star, as we are used to in our solar system, but around a binary star system, TOI-1338. The first big star is like the sun. The other is a red dwarf, which is three times smaller. These stars completely circle each other in a little over 14 days. The planet that orbits these stars is the size of Saturn, which is much larger than the Earth. Although the sunsets and sunrises there look incredibly beautiful, this planet is unlikely to be suitable for any form of life. It's outside the habitable zone of its host stars, so it probably doesn't have liquid water. Mysterious radio signals from outer space have also been received in 2020. We're talking about fast radio bursts. Scientists recorded such signals before, but recently, they have managed to prove that they are repeated after a certain period of time. The new data have forced the scientists to come up with a very bold theory that their source may be a magnetar. A magnetar is a neutron star that is small and has a huge mass compared to ordinary stars like the Sun. But they have the strongest magnetic field in the entire universe. Their lifetime is very short though, only one million years. But what baffled scientists the most this year was discovering that the moon is rusting. Corrosion needs oxygen and water to take place, but the moon doesn't have its own atmosphere to have both. The main theory says the solar wind is to blame. It moves at great speed and scrapes oxygen from the upper layers of the Earth's atmosphere. The wind continues to carry oxygen molecules through space, and eventually, they reach the surface of the moon and cause metal ore to rust. By the way, the signature red color of Mars was created because of the rust. For a long time, there was an atmosphere and water. In combination with iron on its surface, it triggered a long process of rusting, which has lasted since ancient times. Another stunning discovery was found on the surface of the moon with a stratospheric telescope. It's an aircraft that carries a telescope. The plane raises it to an altitude of eight miles, and this allows it to have a picture quality comparable to that of space telescopes. And with the help of such an unusual observatory, scientists were able to find water on the surface of the moon. Water molecules were found in one of the largest craters on the visible side of the satellite. But the number of water molecules is still extremely small there. The Sahara Desert has about 100 times more water than the surface of the moon. Dust storms on Mars can really go crazy. They hurtle through the red planet's southern hemisphere, especially during the summer. These storms can grow and encompass large areas of the planet, as happened in January 2022. Then, a dust storm covered almost twice the area of the United States. 
Could it be something like this that caused one of the robots we sent to Mars to go missing? The atmosphere and climate are harsh on Mars. It's mostly a desert with strong winds and average temperatures of minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It drops down to minus 220 at the poles during the winter. A lander needs to be specifically equipped and very sturdy to withstand such conditions. But researchers thought the Beagle 2 could handle the difficult trip to the Red Planet. June 3, 2003. A team of researchers got one of their pioneering robots they were about to send to space ready. It was a small and compact lander called the Beagle 2. Its mission was to touch down on Mars and search for what the world has been actively looking for for decades now – life on the Red Planet. Now, the touchdown was due on December 25th, but the signal never came. The team tried to contact the spaceship, but at one point, they had to accept they wouldn't be able to reach it. Some thought the landing was too difficult and complex after all, so the lander crashed. But they couldn't find any technical errors. Others had a theory that the lander may have become entangled in its own parachute and fell down to the surface of Mars. Either way, the Beagle 2 was considered missing until 2015, when NASA took pictures of what could be the remains of the lost lander. They weren't just smashed debris, the components actually looked to be intact. The lander's remains were lying with its solar panels partially deployed around 3 miles away from the site where it was supposed to land. Apparently, the Beagle 2 managed to land successfully, but its radio antenna got blocked. That's why researchers couldn't control it from Earth or communicate with it. But no one knows exactly why it happened. Have you heard of a face on Mars? In the 1970s, one of NASA's spaceships took the iconic images of the Martian surface that showed a face-like formation, as you can see in the upper part of the picture. If you have a rich imagination, you can easily see a nose, two eyes, a mouth, and an unusual hairdo. Some even thought it was a monument built on the red planet by another civilization. How about some other unusual things people have found on Mars? Like Happy Face Crater. You can easily see why it has this nickname. Or rocks in different shapes. A pancake, brachiosaurus, or a fish. Mars also has a waffle-shaped island on its surface. It's a 1.2-mile wide feature you can see in the area of lava flows. It might be the result of lava pushing this formation from below. It seems astronomers have also got some images of blue dunes. It's a sea of stunning dark dunes that strong winds sculpted into long lines. They surround the planet's northern polar cap and cover a region as large as Texas. The red planet is usually known for its brown sandy dunes, so these ones certainly came as a surprise. In reality, though, they're not really blue. If you could visit Mars right now just to take a look, you'd see that these dunes appear brown and orange like the rest. And the picture is a false color image. Scientists often use false colors to highlight differences in something. For example, here, it's the difference in depth. Also, the biggest valley on Mars is so large it could eat our Grand Canyon for breakfast. It's a fascinating system of canyons 2,500 miles long called Valles Marineris. And it's over 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon. Now, if you could stretch this Martian canyon, it would go from coast to coast of the entire United States. Since Mars doesn't have any active plate tectonics, no one knows for sure how this canyon formed. One theory says a chain of volcanoes located on the other side of Mars, the one that includes Olympus Mons, bent the crust from the opposite side of the planet. This powerful force caused cracks in the Martian crust as well as activated enormous amounts of water lying under the surface. This water then emerged and carved the rock away. The force activated glaciers too, and they possibly created new pathways in this gigantic canyon system. Volcanoes on the Martian surface could have erupted about 50,000 years ago, although the most powerful eruptions happened 2 to 3 billion years ago. But the planet doesn't have active volcanoes today. Most of the heat stored in its interior during the planet's formation has been lost. So now, Mars's outer crust is way too thick for the molten rock to reach the surface. But a long time ago, eruptions formed giant volcanoes. And these volcanoes most likely had an important role in melting ice deposits, which released floods of water onto the Martian surface. 
Now Mars has a thin atmosphere with a volume of gas, mostly carbon dioxide, less than 1% of Earth's. But 4 billion years ago, it was way warmer and wetter than now. Its atmosphere must have been thicker back then, too. That's why it could create a powerful greenhouse effect and trap sunlight. Mars also has a powerful magnetic field. Similar to Earth's, it formed because of the currents of molten metals in the planet's core. But unlike our home planet, Mars lost its magnetic field after its core had cooled down. And without it, the planet didn't have any protection from the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles flowing from the sun. The solar wind pulled away most of Mars's atmosphere in just a couple of hundred million years, give or take. This is what makes those powerful Martian dust storms even more intense. Mars has a fascinating history. Judging by the planet's glaciers, Mars has probably gone through multiple ice ages, just like Earth. A team of researchers got images of about 60,000 Martian rocks. Rocks were different in size and distributed randomly, which means they probably formed during different ice ages. Glaciers hide their own stories, too. Who knows what kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes could be trapped inside. Now, if you could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago, on Mars, of course, the chances are you'd see spectacular scenes of flooding. Maybe there would even be some form of life on the planet's surface. A strong meteorite impact that formed the red planet's gale crater could be something that triggered that mega flood. After that collision, the temperatures on the planet got insanely hot. This caused the melting of all that ice that was stored on the Martian surface at that time. The flooding was so massive, it changed the geological structure of the planet's surface. It carved out big ripples, as well as waves in the sedimentary rock. Now, speaking of water, vapor has been noticed escaping the atmosphere of Mars. Also, researchers have found some evidence of water flowing on the planet's surface. There are dark streaks in the soil. They seem to get bigger in the summer and shrink over the winter. There are numerous dried-out valleys and river channels on the planet. It's possible that liquid water once flowed there. Now, most of it could be locked up in ice caps or even hidden under the surface. More and more things hint that Mars used to be habitable. Mars is the only planet we know about where only robots live. Five rovers make up the Martian population. Those are Perseverance, Opportunity, Spirit, Sojourner, and Curiosity. These robots are there to take pictures and samples of soil and air and maybe even find life on the red planet. And someday, we may reunite with them on Mars. Who knows? Oh, and by the way, if you really could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago on Mars, then I'd like to buy you lunch and talk about it. My treat! The constellation Orion is the brightest one in the sky. Orion is also in the night sky during the winter months when it's dark for the most hours. This makes Orion the most recognizable constellation to almost everyone in the world. Most stars don't seem to move too much or change their positions in the sky. This is not because stars are static. It's because our Sun is moving along with them at about 483,000 miles per hour. It's a grand parade orbiting together around the Milky Way. The three stars that form the asterism, or star picture, of the belt of Orion have appeared in the same position for many thousands of years. There's a theory that the ancient Egyptians used the belt stars of Orion as a template for the placement of the three pyramids of Giza. The brightest star in Orion's belt is the middle one, called Alnilam. That's where the 481-foot-high Great Pyramid of Khufu was placed. To Khufu's west side, and in precise alignment with it, stands the 471-foot-tall Pyramid Khafre. That's exactly where the star Alnitak is directly aligned to the bright middle star of the belt. To Khufu's east side, where the dimmest star of Orion's belt, Mintaka, is slightly offline with the other two stars, is the smallest pyramid of the three. Menkare is 213 feet high and slightly offline from the other two pyramids. This one example serves to illustrate the profound impact that the constellation Orion has had on human history. Orion's heroic-sized figure inspired the ancient Greeks to create a tapestry-like story. It involves six other constellations spread across the winter, spring, and summer sky. Let's see what this story tells us. Orion is pictured as a hunter. Back then, hunting was a big deal. Hunters supplied food. 
So there's a lot attached to this constellation. The whole food chain, in fact. In the sky, Orion is in combat with the constellation Taurus the bull. Except, Taurus is not really a bull, it's an auroch. Aurochs are extinct now, but they were once plentiful in Europe. Standing six feet tall at the shoulder with long pointed horns, aurochs were powerful and fearsome creatures. There's a cave in the country of Spain that is filled with gorgeous paintings of aurochs. These pictures date back to 15,000 years ago, exquisitely drawn with inks that have not faded over the course of 150 centuries. The bulges in the rock stand out in three dimensions as the shoulder muscles of the aurochs. The constellation of Taurus, the auroch, is also in the cave, with the famous star clusters, the Pleiades, on its back, and the Hyades on its snout. The internet has a thrilling virtual tour of this Cave of the Bulls, full of aurochs. Maybe it should be renamed into the Cave of the Aurochs instead. Recently, the full DNA signature of an auroch was recovered from a well-preserved auroch skeleton. And scientists hope to breed these animals back into existence. Good luck and best wishes to this attempt to revive an extinct species. Aldebaran is the bright red giant star that marks the eye of Taurus. Bulls, when angry, always get this blood-in-the-eye look. Does it make you wonder why the bull's eye on a dartboard or archery target is always red? Hmm. Creeping up behind Orion is Leo the lion. Lions don't just live in Africa in times long past. The Cave of the Bulls in Spain has a painting of Leo the lion. Yep, these prehistoric people were drawing the constellations of the zodiac. But that's another story for another time. Orion gets rid of both Taurus and Leo. And then the story gets interesting. Orion claims in his moment of triumph, I can defeat any animal I want. Orion's boast becomes the center of this sky drama when Gaia, or Earth, decides to get involved. Orion's words resounded throughout the world. This may be at the time in prehistory when civilization was changing from a nomadic hunter-gatherer tribal society to an agrarian society. The latter developed villages and towns 12,000 years ago. The human population was increasing and food supplies were diminishing. Something had to be done about Orion and all the hunters, or social development would be stymied. Now enter Gaia into the story, but not into the sky. There is no constellation of Gaia in the sky. Gaia is Earth. Born parentless directly from the elemental chaos, Gaia was the feminine personification of our planet, and the word itself means soil. Brightsiders may be interested in a modern scientific theory that also personifies Earth as a living organism. It's called the Gaia Theory. It first appeared in the 1970s. The Gaia Theory presents Earth as a biosphere, as if it were alive. The theory claims that all components of the planet work together as one totally interconnected dynamic system. This is called symbiosis, or synergy. Together, they produce the ideal conditions for life. Life adapts to regulate the atmosphere at 21% oxygen, the salinity of the oceans at a maximum of 24.7%, and planetary temperatures at 57 degrees Fahrenheit. To illustrate how life adapts to maintain control of the changes in planetary temperatures, the authors of the Gaia theory created the fictional planet Daisy World. Daisy World is completely covered by white and black daisies. When the sun becomes too hot, the black daisies start disappearing while the white daisies increase in population. The whiteness of these flowers reflects sunlight and the planet cools down. If the sun isn't hot enough, the white daisies reduce their population and the number of the black daisies grows. The black flowers absorb sunlight and the planet warms up. This is Gaia at work. It's basically the same principle that created oxygen and produced the ozone layer in the atmosphere. This layer helps to block the harmful ultraviolet light from the sun. Scientists have been slow to accept the Gaia theory because of the lack of convincing evidence. But these days, we have self-learning AI supercomputers. They can probably make it possible to integrate Earth's biological and geological systems. This way, we might get a clear picture of how the planet functions as a self-sustaining biosphere. Huh, wouldn't that be something? Now we can go back to the story of Orion and see how Gaia took care of the problem Orion's boast created for the planet. Obviously, Gaia couldn't send animals fiercer than a lion or an auroch to subdue Orion. So Gaia went small. 
she chose a poisonous scorpion to do the job, and it did the job. In the summer, the constellation of the scorpion crawls at almost the same latitude as Orion's foot. The scorpion may be a small animal in the same arachnid family as spiders and ticks, but in the sky, Scorpius is the 33rd largest constellation out of the 88 of them. There is a general rule that the larger a constellation is, the longer ago it was created by early star watchers. They had their pick of stars, first come, first served. And so, they made large constellations first and little constellations later. By the way, if you were the first in line at a buffet dinner, wouldn't you take big helpings and let the end of the line have the scraps? Think chocolate cake. Oh, sure, I'll only take a little piece. Nah, I don't think so. In this story of Orion, we have a collection of large, conspicuous constellations, like Leo, Taurus, Orion, and Scorpius, which confirms the great age of the story. Three smaller constellations, Lepus the Hare, Canis Major, and Canis Minor, Orion's two hunting dogs, complete the Orion star tapestry and add an interesting subplot. What we have then is a fable of two different worldviews or cosmologies, that of Gaia and that of Orion. One is feminine and the other is classically masculine. One is committed to dominating the natural world, that's the Orion archetype. The other is committed to the survival of the planet against all circumstances, that's Gaia. The two may seem opposed, but perhaps they're meant to be complementary. Look, Orion and the Scorpion are on the opposite sides of the sky, one in the winter, the other in the summer. They act like two poles, north and south, of the same magnet, our planet. This is what we see happening these days. Science and technology are becoming more and more sensitive to the natural environment. Myriads of satellites are monitoring the biosphere of Earth. Gaia and Orion are starting to work together toward what the ancient Greeks called Kalokagathia, or harmony. That's what we call synergy and symbiosis these days. Let's keep that synergy going strong.